Hi, <clears throat> I'm Randy Wicker, and I'm active on Facebook. I co the Marsha B. Johnson fan page. And this I'm filming off of a screen. Someone named Hugh Ryan had interviewed me and was doing a, apparently did an article for Out, subscribed to Out Magazine on the internet. You know, has fashion, but pop up popnography, entertainment, news, opinion, and pride. Now, I don't have time to wade through all this pop culture. It's so common, you know, in the gay thing, but of course an article about Marsha B. Johnson, which impresses me. Uh, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm, maybe with permission from Hugh and Out Magazine, I'll put this on YouTube, but it's called Power to the People, Exploring Marsha P. Johnson's Queer and Liberation the title. I'm going to read it because I don't think many people by Hugh Ryan, Thursday, 8-24-2017, the 10.53 p.m. Zero shares, I see now. Zero shout shares. I'm going to share it. I hope I can share it. Twitter. Okay. About blank. Okay. Oh, log in and tweet. I am in login. I ha I'm in. Oh, I don't know how to do that. Let's see if I can go on Facebook. I think I put it on Facebook already. Oh, I can't do it. These things that are not connected, so my cookies aren't working right. Perhaps my favorite image of Marsha B. Johnson, and there are lots to choose from, comes from the 1970 gang liberation protest, front protest at Bellevue Hospital where doctors were using shock treatments to cure homosexuals. In an oversized fur coat, Johnson leans against the corner of a building, a dulcery cigarette hanging from one hand. In the other, she holds a poster with simple black letters that say, Power to the People. Which people? All people, but particularly her people. Queer people, street people, activists, artists, trans women, drag queens, sex workers, the poor, the homeless, and those who struggle with mental illness. At a time when being any one of these things might land you in jail or the morgue, Johnson was all of those things tied up in a messy package with gorgeous trash culture bow to top. It's not the poster that makes the picture so endearing, though. In fact, there's something missing from the photo that draws me to it. Run a Google search, run a Google image search on Johnson, and you'll get page after page of results showing her with a smile as wide as 14th Street, smiling in a club, smiling on the corner, smiling in a photo by Andy Warhol, smiling on stage with the hot peaches, smiling while her best friend Sylvia Rivera throws her fist up in the air, smiling even when the rest of her face looks exhausted and done, smiling on professional sales tags for the hot topic for his hipsters, urban effing outfitters, smiling, smiling, always smiling. But not at Bellevue. <coughs> Diane Davies, the photographer, captured Johnson in a moment when her mask was down. There's a flicker of joy in the upturned corners of her mouth. But in 1970, after some 25 years of smiling, she was just a sh that was just a shape of Marcia's, of that was just the shape of Johnson's face. Her smile was her sword and shield, and to be who she was meant always coming armed and armored. That smile kept her alive until it didn't. It might seem odd to suggest that Davies a white, cisgendered, queer woman known for documenting the early gay liberation movement on the East Coast could capture Johnson in a vulnerable moment of repose. After all, if there's one thing we're supposed to know about white lesbians in the 70s is that many of them were viciously transphobic separatists who had no room for trans women. Certainly that virulent strain of gender fascist feminism did exist, and it still exists today. But it's hardly the full story. Johnson got along well with lesbians and even attended a few meetings of the Daughter of Belitis, the first national lesbian organization in America. 
In the activist gay world of the 1970s, both lesbians and trans women, many of whom used the word transvestite to describe themselves, were awfully marginalized for their gender. Gay sisters didn't Gay sisters didn't think too bad of transvestites, Johnson said in a 1970 interview collected by Carla Jay's book, Out of the Closet, Voice of Liberation. Gay brothers do. When I look at Davy's photo, I like to think that maybe this is the face that Johnson saw in the mirror in the morning before girding it with that smile that enabled her to survive a world that hardly had been, uh, that could hardly, that enabled her to survive in a world that could barely even acknowledge her existence, let let alone celebrate her brilliance. I've been looking at that photo a lot recently. Every time I hear about another murdered trans woman of color, at least a dozen times this year, I pull it up. Every time I see a new homage to Marsha P., a documentary, a short film, a pay-in to her presence at the Stonewall riots, I look at it again. I'm trying to see how we got here to a place where we can memorialize Johnson as the saint of Christopher Street, yet ignore the consistent violence of her trans daughters and granddaughters will face. How can we fetishize Johnson's president at Stonewall, yet ignore the demands she made of the queer community at large? By the way, this is an incredible story. That's why I'm doing this. I think her smile is a big part of that story. Marsha B. Johnson was born in Elizabeth, New Jersey on August 24, 1945, near the end of World War II. The P in her name stood for Pay It No Mind. She lived most of her life in the, in the nimbus of New York City, but she always maintained a close, if fraught, relationship with her family back in Jersey, according to Al Michaels, her nephew. Now 36, Michael remembers what it was what it was like a holiday whenever Johnson came over, and that kid the kids flocked to her because she brought them treats, beads and candies and flowers. Her mother would make Johnson put on men's clothing when she entered the house, but invariably Johnson would have parted with them by the next time she visited. She'd give you the shirt right off her back, Michael says with a laugh. You like it? Here you can have it. Johnson's grandmother may have disapproved, but it was always with an undercurrent of love. It was actually Johnson's mother. But it was always with an undercut of love, Michael says. And when Johnson had one of her spells, like the time she was reported lost in Hoboken wearing only her underwear, it was actually wearing only a feather boa, her family, and a jock strap, her family always picked her up and brought her home to the hospital. Actually, the police department in Hoboken took her over the mental ward. That's where I met her sister. If every day was like a holiday with Johnson, however, then real holidays were extra. They'd walk up from the train. Marcia and like 15 or 20 of her friends, Michael says, a house would be full of people dancing. Everyone who ever met Johnson remembers this aspect of her personality, her gregarious, generous nature, which made you feel like you were at the coolest party in town. And often Johnson was the coolest place in town. She was a member of the Avant Drag performance group, The Hot Peaches, with whom she toured America and Europe, performing comical songs and spoken word poetry. She was photographed by Andy Warhol, who also painted her as part of his Ladies and Gentlemen series of trans portraiture. One time, recalls Michaels, when he was DJing in New York City, he pulled out an Earth, Wind, and Fire album, only to discover an image on the album artwork. Oh, God, that's a beautiful picture, Marsha, I've never seen before. Oh, I loved her so much. She lived me for 12 years. Johnson is seen on Netflix, The Death and Life of Marsha B. Johnson. But Johnson, that's going to be on uh, Netflix, I think, late, thir- I think around Trans Day of Remembrance uh, in this coming uh, November 2017. But Johnson was an icon whose influence was felt far beyond New York. Filmmaker Stephen Winter, who recently worked as a consulting producer on David Francis' new documentary, The Death and Life of Marsha B. Johnson, premiering October 6th on Netflix, remembers hearing about Johnson in 1990 when he was a newly radicalized 20-year-old involved in ACT UP Chicago. People got to understand, he says over the phone one afternoon, before there was Snapchat and Facebook 
queer TV or gay characters or gay books, there was Marsha walking around. Johnson is emblematic of what black queer feminist thinker Alex Pauline Grubbs describes as the never straight, those queer pioneers who were unable or unwilling to hide their differences and thus forced queerness to be publicly acknowledged wherever they went. Almost always, those differences manifested themselves through gender, which is why time and again, gender-variant people have been at, been at the forefront of queer liberations like Stonewall. Perhaps the least important but most discussed aspect of Johnson's life is what she did or did not do during the Stonewall riot. Almost every modern depiction of the riot includes Johnson, or a character obviously modeled after her. She's the only real person to be portrayed in Roland Emmerich's underwhelming 2015 white fantasy Stonewall. <laughs> what a beautiful slam. According to Stonewall, according to Johnson, in an interview she gave to Eric Marcus that night, I was uptown and didn't get downtown until 2 o'clock. When I got down, the place was already on fire, and there was a raid already. The riots had already started. I didn't know that until I read Eric Marcus. He taped an interview with me in this apartment. He described her as a drug addict, which she wasn't, you know, a homeless person. I went over to Randy Wicker's house, and I sound so horrible on that interview. I mean, I'm being very dismissive of Marsha. It must have been horrible for her to live with me, but she did, and she loved me, and she put up with me. It was a great blessing in my life. People thought I was crazy when I took her in. That's, that's riots plural, because the Stonewall riot was an anti-police insurrection that lasted six days. It really only lasted one night. It was sporadic, the next five. In our rush to pinpoint the first punch thrown, we have lost the vast scope and meaning of that rebellion. And the fact that it followed other LGBT anti-cop riots that happened in the late 50s and through the 60s, including, here, here, boy, Hugh Ryan, you're a good journalist, including the Compton's Cafeteria Riot in 1966, San Francisco, and Cooper's Donut Riot in 1959, Los Angeles. In all three incidents, a community of trans women, trans women, <coughs> and poor hus trans women and poor hustlers was at the forefront of the uprising. Johnson may not have hurled the first shot shot glass at Stonewall, but she was a major force in creating the visible queer community that rose up that evening. Her fearless presence announced itself in her goodwill dresses and the headpieces she crafted from flower district castoffs. If silence equaled death, then Johnson in a very literal way gave us life. This is just beautiful. But being a legend doesn't pay the bills. Johnson lived on and off the streets for most of her life and relied on charity and sex work to survive. For more than a decade, she stayed in New Jersey in the New Jersey apartment of gay activist Randy Wicker, who had become one of her closest friends. But her best friend for nearly her entire life was Sylvia Rivera. According to Rivera, the two met on the streets when Rivera was 12 and Johnson was 18. Together, they conceptualized the idea that trans people were a marginalized community, separate from but related to the larger queer world, and that they had their own needs, which were often neglected or sacrificed even as they put their bodies on the line as foot soldiers in the gay revolution, in quotes. Shortly after Stonewall, Johnson and Rivera founded Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, or STAR, and created Star House, a short-lived, unfunded communal space for trans women who had been living on the streets. Starr had a radical platform that would not seem out of place from today's movement for black lives. It included free gender expression, an end to prison injustice and homelessness, and the creation of an inclusive community that rejected binding definitions of gender and sexual identity, according to Stephen L. Cohen's book, the Gay Liberation Youth Movement in New York. What doesn't that platform sound like? About 90% of the organized LGBT rights movement today, <clears throat> despite the fact that nearly all queer political groups lay claim to Stonewall as a mythic origin point, the movement in which our movement really began, very soon willing to embrace the radical politics of the women who were there. Marsha was naming these things at precisely and powerfully for a long time, Rayanna Gossett explains. 
For, she, for years, she was a young community organizer at the Sylvia Rivera Law Project. Gaza has been working to unearth and restore Johnson's legacy. Together with female coach Shasha Wurzel, she is the creator of Happy Birthday, Marsha, a forthcoming somewhat ah historical narrative short film that imagines Johnson in the hours leading up to the Stonewall riot. Rivera and Johnson <clears throat> are almost always mentioned together, but Rivera is often credited with their political thinking. Give me why I take a soap of soda. Oh. Oh. Gossett says, in the same interview in which Johnson recalled out the transphobia of gay men and mentioned her alliances with lesbians, she also advocated for a queer movement that centered on anti-prison, anti-homeless activism. This was two years before Sylvia Rivera's infamous Pride speech. In the speech at Pride in 1973 when she was booed and railing at the white middle-class complacency of the movement. However, Gossett isn't arguing about who had which idea first. Political imagination and freedom dreams don't happen in a silo, she says. It takes a community because we have to be able to see that our issues are shared with others and they are created by systematic forces, not personal failures. Why then does Rivera get all the credit? The truth is, it's not about who said what, but it's about who we're able to hear. Marcia survives by using the classic trickster mode, says Winter, an expert on the archetype of the queer black trickster. His latest film, Jason and Shirley, is imagining the first such character in cinema, Jason Holiday, from Shirley Clark's experimental 1967 documentary, Portrait of Jason. Marsha allowed people to think she was dizzy, and she was a little dizzy to ensure her survival. No, she was dizzy at that time, really mental too. He says, showing anger for a black person in America is the quickest way to get censured, ignored, punished, or killed. The one exception to that rule, the sassy black friend who can get a little angry so long as it's a funny, you-go-girl kind of way. In that case, anger can even be rewarded, at least in a limited sense. There's a scene in The Death, of, Death and Life of Marsha B. Johnson in which this dramatic plays out as a drunken gay white man gleefully accosts Johnson on Christopher Street. Even as he tells her how, to, how brave she is, he also mansplains to the camera and Johnson herself all about her gender. Jan Johnson's laughing protests. <clears throat> how do you do? How do you know all this, she asks pointedly. Go ignored. It's a perfect encapsulation of how a loving embrace can also be a straitjacket. White gay culture has always found a place for black feminine joy, Winter says, as a way to express their own pain and suffering. And thus Johnson gets turned into a symbol for all queer people. But all also means the universal experiences of gay white men. Johnson's specific pain, her specific suffering, takes a black seat. It's why we know Johnson's smile, but not the thoughts that were running through her head. It's why we can memorialize Johnson as a martyr, but ignore the causes she fought for. Thankfully, a number of black trans female activists have refused to let Johnson be reduced to a single image. Johnson lives on in Gossett and Wurzel's short, short film, which they hope to release next year. They're also already working on a follow-up feature-length film about Johnson. In addition, her memory is preserved in the new Marsha P. Johnson Institute. The brainchild of 29-year-old community organizer, Ellie Hearns, go Ellie, visited me here. Hearns says she created the Institute specifically because Marsha is being idolized in a way that removes her from the real political goals. The Institute creates a space for black trans women, particularly those who, like Johnson, live in poverty or on the fringes of mainstream society to come together and work towards their shared empowerment. It also creates a space for them to deal with some problems some have, like mental illness, drug addiction, whatever. Like Johnson, black trans women who want to be active in the modern queer movement are forced to focus on organizing goals of others, Hearn says, because they lack organizations that prioritize their needs. In philanthropy, one penny 
of every $100 goes to trans issues. That's why I give only to trans organizations generally. So you can tr just imagine how little money black trans women actually receive. Yet these same women are among the most in need members of the community, experiencing significant levels of poverty, discrimination, ill violence, ill health, violence, and death. I left them 50 or so Marsha B. Johnson buttons when I was down there at Ruby House, told them to go out and get at least $3 each for them. Some said they were going to wear them when they were out. Johnson's own death has never inadequately explained. Her body was fished out of the Hudson River one afternoon on July 6, 1992. Although the NPD officially ruled it a suicide, many of those, let's see, Many of those closest to her believe it was either an accident or murder. According to the New York City Anti-Violence Project at the, t at the time, 1992 was the worst year on record for anti-LGBT violence. Two months after Johnson's death, Haiti Mae Cohen's and Brian Mock were burned to death by white supremacists in their apartment in Salem, Oregon. Just think, times don't seem to change, do they? Two months later, Petty Officer Third Class Alan Schlinder was beaten to death by a shipmate in a public toilet in Japan. His body was so brutalized that pathologists who performed the autopsy compared his injuries to those often seen after a high-speed car crash. Today, the reported murders, you know, I'm getting to the end. I don't want to have to cut this off. I'll, I'll, I'll finish in the next video, but you know enough. You know how to look it up. I think, I think we've told enough that this is an incredible, credible story, real story, with few errors about the life of Marsha B. Johnson. This has been Randy Wicker. Thank you for watching. I hope that you will join the movement to erect a monument to Marsha B. Johnson, both in Sheridan Square, which should not bear the name Sheridan because he was a mass murderer of, of Indians and almost exterminated by the buffalo, and, and other in your town, wherever you are, build a monument to Marsha B. Johnson and spread the message of love, love, of being a human being, not being necessarily a screaming politico. Thank you so much for your time. I'm so honored to be able to read this to you.